Okay, so it feels like it's been a while since we've uh, had a good lecture, but um, it has been a crazy couple weeks. So we're now going to look at Module 6, Napoleon and French Revolution. And so here in the French Revolution is definitely one of the most uh, important revolutions in European history uh, by far. And so in this lesson, we're really going to focus on the origins of the French Revolution of 1789. Now, our story about the road to the French Revolution really has to begin with French society. Um, if you look at French society prior to the start of the French Revolution, you'll see here that it was divided into three major groups known as estates. So in the estate system, there are three different parts of society. The first estate was the clergy. Now, the clergy was a very small group in French society. Uh, in, in fact, they only accounted for about 1% of the total population. Um, and yet, they controlled between 10 and 15% of the total land, okay, in France. Now, that's a very small group of people controlling a fairly large piece of land. Also, they're exempt from taxes. So you have the largest group of landowners, for the most part, to some extent, exempt from paying taxes on that land. And they're exempt from a lot of other taxes as well. Um, not only are the clergy exempt from taxes, but they also had the right to collect taxes of their own, um, which we know as, you know, tithe or religious taxes. Everyone in French society had to actually pay a portion of their income to the church by law, okay? It was a mandatory tax to the Catholic church that you uh, had to pay so that the church could maintain its properties and pay all of its priests and uh, religious officials. So the clergy had many benefits because of the fact that they were part of the first estate. Now the second estate, or the second group in French society, was the nobility. And the nobility, like the clergy, were a very small portion of the French society, about 2 to 5% of the population of France. And um, they actually owned a lot of land too. Anywhere between 20 and 30% of the land was owned by the nobles. So they were pretty well off for the most part. And like the clergy, the nobles are also exempt from most taxes. So now you have about 30 to 40% of all landowners who don't have to pay taxes for the most part. That means people who own nothing, the poor people are going to pay all the taxes, basically. Like the clergy, the nobles were also, um, you know, they didn't have to pay their taxes, but they could also collect money from the people. For instance, they were still collecting feudal dues. If you remember the feudal system, where, like the manorial system, where they had people that would, they would lend their land out to and then take half or 70% of what was grown as tax. Uh, so you could collect money from the people. Um, and so, like I said, if you'll remember back in, our, in the beginning part of you know, this class history, you know, the first section of this, you remember that the Middle Ages, you know, they had the serfs laboring on the land and the lords and all that stuff. Well, this system has actually survived in France well into the 1700s. And the French nobles are actually uh, are able to require their peasants uh, on the land to pay them either labor obligations or actual money. Uh, just for, you know, having the privilege of living and working on our land. So the nobles are getting a really good deal just like the clergy are. Then you have the last group. Uh, this is the largest group by far. It's the commoners. Everyone else falls into this group. So anywhere from 95 to 97% of the population of France ends up in the third estate. Now, it's actually quite diverse within this group uh, because on the one hand, you could be rather wealthy and well off and still be in the third estate because you're not a noble. Or, you know, you could be a part of what's known as the uh, bourgeoisie. Um, and so the bourgeoisie is the, you know, that's the top of the third estate. So if you have what would be the lower class, this is like the super upper middle class, I guess. Um, and some of them own a great deal of land also, just like the nobles and clergy do. Um, in other words, they're quite wealthy. Other th others of them may not be super wealthy, but they have professions like doctors and lawyers. They're well-respected. They also fall into this category of the bourgeoisie. And the biggest difference between them and the other estates um, would be that they are forced to actually pay taxes on their land. Um, and so uh, you might be well-educated, 
and you might be well off, but you also couldn't hold certain positions in government, right? Um, or in the military, because you're not actually part of the nobility. So to be in the third estate, you might, you know, have just have just enough money to be well off, but not enough to be a nobleman. Uh, in fact, some of the upper lower class here uh, actually had more money than some people in the nobility, but the nobility didn't have to pay taxes, and the and the bourgeoisie did. The upper uh, third estate did. Uh, so you certainly don't have the same privileges. And what made you a nobleman versus just a rich guy who had a good profession and was well educated? What was the difference? Birth. That's it. What family were you born into? That was really the only thing that divided you. Okay. Um, the third estate, the vast majority of them, though, were the urban workers, though. All right. And these are under the bourgeoisie. Uh, bourgeoisie. Somebody is probably going to leave a YouTube comment about how I'm saying that wrong, but I don't really care. I'm, I don't take French. Is it bourgeoisie? Anybody take French? I don't pronounce Bourgeoisie. Bourgeoisie. Okay. Bourgeoisie. Sorry. If there's any French people watching this, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. Um, so for the urban workers, their main issue is that they need to earn enough money so that they can provide food for their family. But remember, they're going to be taxed at a very high rate, and this is going to cut their earnings quite a bit. Now, this is also going to create quite a bit of tension. Uh, uh, and so then you finally have the peasants, the peasantry. Uh, just like the bourgeoisie, uh, these peasants, um, there are some peasants that own some land. Uh, they're going to be fairly well off in terms of, you know, being a peasant. This is like your lower middle class and, like, poor people. Okay? Um, lower middle class, like, you make 40 grand a year, 50 grand a year. I mean, 40, 50 grand a year. You can have a decent life. You're not going to get ahead in life. You're not going to be able to store anything up for yourself, but you're going to be able to make ends meet, right? Then you have the group that is like, they work uh, half shifts at McDonald's. That's their only job. You might have a little bit of money, but the government's going to take half of it, and you're barely surviving. And today, we have government assistance. Back then, they don't. You're just poor and broke, and you have nothing, and you might eat once every three days, and it's miserable, right? You're having to pay taxes. Um, and so you have a, you know, they got to pay feudal dues. They have to work the land of the nobility, uh, and they're barely scraping by. And so you kind of look at this, uh, you know, political cartoon from the 1700s, and guess who this guy is down here, right? Um, He's the third estate, and uh, it's expressing the tension that has developed within the estate system, and that the third estate felt that the other two estates were burdening them because uh, the other two estates had these great privileges. But it was the third estate that's actually producing all of the wealth for France, who's working all over the land, who has all of the well, good-paying jobs and, and blue-collar jobs, and they're holding the whole thing up, and yet they have the lowest number of privileges. So we can see that uh, men, uh, you know, tensions developed prior to the French Revolution. Another long-term factor that leads to the French Revolution was economic problems that France had. Uh, because during the time of Louis XIV and then Louis XV, France was nearly constantly at war with England. This left them pretty much bankrupt. And if you look at this pie chart, you see how half the annual income of France was being directed just towards paying the interest on the national debt, not even paying down the debt itself. But France is in so much debt that it's actually having difficulty managing that debt. And so these are economic problems that are going to be interconnected with social problems because you need to raise more money. Guess where the burden is going to fall if, you're not, if you can't tax the first or second estate? Now, if you look at this, there are some really clear lines being drawn here between what's happening today in the United States and what's happening at that point in France from an economic standpoint. Uh, right now, our national debt is like $31.5 trillion, something like that. Um, when 
So since the current administration took over, the national debt has increased by $7.3 trillion in 28 months. 28 months, $7.3 trillion. To put that in perspective, the entire national debt to get from owing zero to $7.3 trillion, which is just what we've increased in 28 months, to get from zero debt to that much debt took 215 years. From George Washington to George W. Bush, the national debt never peaked over $7.3 trillion. Today, we have increased our national debt by $7.3 trillion in less than two and a half years. Now, what does that mean? Just like the French had trouble managing their debt, the interest payments alone on that debt, if we were to pay just the interest on that debt to who we owe it to, would run us about $400 billion a year, which is approximately 30% of our annual budget currently. Within 10 years, we will, ha if our debt continues to go up, our interest payments will cost us more than we spend annually on the military. Just paying the interest, no principal on that debt. Within 30 years, we will be spending more money paying off interest than we do on all aspects of our country, all other aspects combined. If you think that this is not going to be bad for America, you are foolish, okay? This is not a good situation economically because we also have this idea, well, you should tax the rich. 90% of all federal income taxes are paid by the top 10% money earners in the United States. The vast majority of rich people are already paying the vast majority of taxes. So if we continue to spend money, we go, that's not a problem. We'll raise taxes on the rich. Okay, great. But they're already being taxed far more than everybody else. So if you're going to raise money, where's that money going to be raised from? The middle class. That's not going to be good. Okay, so just understand, these things lead to problems. By 1787, France's economic problems are so bad that the French Minister for Finance called a meeting with the representatives from the first and second estates to figure out how they're going to deal with the economic crisis. Now, how are we going to deal with economics? Hey, we should ask the people who don't pay taxes. Hey, how are we going to raise more money, people who don't pay taxes? Well, what do you think those two people are going to say? Uh, we should tax poor people more. They're going to be like, hey, we need to raise more taxes. Do y'all want to pay some taxes? Uh, no. You think we should raise taxes on poor people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. When they meet, the finance minister has three points for his plan. Uh, the first part of the plan, to have the government cut expenditures. Hey, stop spending, more, stop spending money. This means more money is available to pay down debt. The second part is to reduce trade restrictions. If you increase more free trade, this would increase... Uh, revenue, which is allows you to have more money to pay back the national debt. The third part of the plan, which is the most revolutionary, the finance minister proposes that the first and second estates should pay taxes on their land. Uh-oh. They're not going to like that. Well, as you might expect, this proposal, because it's so revolutionary, was greeted with a little bit of concern and skepticism. And you can see, again, you have the uh, political cartoon. My dear creatures, you have assembled... Uh, assembled you, I have assembled you here to de deliberate on the sauce in which you should be served. He's talking to like chickens and ducks and stuff. He's basically saying, hey, how are we going to cook you? That's basically what they're asking, right? And um, if the you know, second estate is going to pay taxes, there's going to be a major change to how uh, French society is run. All, not every member of the first and second estate dismissed this plan. Many of them recognized that in order to pull France out of their problems, they're going to have to pay some taxes. But the issue was, if they're going to pay uh, taxes, they wanted political power in return. Now, if you remember, what kind of political government does France practice? Absolute monarchy, right? And um, 
if they're going to start, you know, they're saying, hey, you can't be an absolute monarchy and then ask us to pay taxes. So we want some power as well. Well, <laughs> that's not going to go over well with the monarchy. Okay? And so really, it, it absolute monarchy really kind of works as long as the monarch that's in charge is, you know, wise. But if he's not, it's going to become a problem. And unfortunately for France, when we get to King Louis XVI, he is a king who really doesn't know how to use his power very well. He's largely uninterested in running the government. He has a very negative view of the monarch. And so he has a very negative view of the people. The monarchy starts to, um, you know, be questioned. And you start seeing things like this, uh, where you have King Louis XIV and his queen Marie Antoinette from Austria, or Louis XVI. Um, and his queen, Marie Antoinette, they're like a beast with two heads. And it says, uh, the two are but one. And uh, notice how King Louis is very beast-like with horns. And, it, uh, you know, it's never very good if you're starting to put horns on a king. It usually means that somebody's probably thinking bad of you. And then look at the queen, Antoinette, Marie Antoinette. What is she? Medusa. She's got snakes coming out of her head, right? Uh, so this is quite clearly uh, a bad look on the monarchy. Um, and, and this is, you know, one of the cleanest images that you can find of how they're represented because quite a few of these, uh, they get pretty nasty, very like pornographic, in fact, uh, in how the French people, uh, represent, uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, they use a particular W war word quite a bit to, uh, characterize, uh, Marie Antoinette and, uh, depict that, uh, as well. And so just a very negative view of the monarchy is created and, it's in part, it's connected with the economic problems because at the time, it's massive chaos. The king and queen are still, you know, throwing parties. They're in massive debt. They can't get through anything. And they're having these massive week-long parties where they're eating food and throwing up and eating more and drinking and just wasting money. Marie Antoinette gets uh, labeled as a spendthrift, which, um, you know, whether she is or not, she's definitely spending a lot of money. Uh, and allegedly, she had, you know, um, they're at a party. This is kind of a, um, I don't know if it's 100% true or not, but the, uh, the idea is that they're at a party one day, and somebody comes up to Marie Antoinette, and they're all sitting around eating dessert, right? And they go, hey, uh, y'all are sitting around eating dessert and lav living lavishly. What do you think about the people in France not having enough bread to eat? And you're sitting here wasting food. And she looks at him and she says, they don't have enough bread. <sighs> Let them eat cake. <laughs> Which is pretty elitist. Because she's sitting here with a table full of desserts and people are starving in the street. And she's like, what do you mean they don't have bread? Just give them some, let them eat cake, you know. Uh, which is, that doesn't go over well. Of course, that could have been propaganda, you know, just because people were upset with her. But um, obviously, most likely it is propaganda. She probably didn't actually say this. It's probably made up about her. But again, it points to the issue that there's a very negative view of the monarchy. Um, and the king and queen are far removed from the problems that the people are facing. Well, by 1789, those economic problems still have not been resolved. So the king decides to call for a meeting of the estates general. Now, this is similar to the British Parliament or the American Congress. But uh, remember, when the absolute monarchy started, they stopped calling the Estates General. In fact, 1789, this is the first time that the Estates General has met since 1614. 175 years have passed since the last time he actually called a meeting. And so King Louis calls a meeting, and um, he wants the members of the first and second and third estates to give him advice on how he should rule. Well, they elect delegates to represent them, and uh, particularly the members of the third estate elect people, and they're commoners, right? And they're quite excited because they want the king to hear their grievances. They want to talk about how they're the ones shouldering the tax burden. They want to talk about... Um, how they have all these grievances, how they can't hold certain military and government positions, they want more rights, and they see this as an opportunity to meet with the king. 
and gain a little bit more political power. And of course, the clergy and nobility are only interested in getting more political power, especially if they're going to have to start paying taxes. However, the meeting gets off to a pretty rocky start. Uh, remember, it's been 175 years, and nobody really knows how to run a meeting of the Estates General because they've never been to one. So they all show up and they're like, okay, how do we do this, right? And um, there very quickly becomes this controversy about who gets to vote and how voting is going to work. Now, in the 16th last meeting, they voted by a state, meaning that each estate had one vote. This is problematic because that means that there's three votes that get cast on every issue. If the first estate votes yes, the second estate votes yes, in a way, it doesn't really matter what the third estate does. Remember, they're 95% of the population. So the first two estates both, both go, hey, are we going to pay more taxes? No, no. Sorry, a third estate, you lose. Hey, third estate, we're going to raise your taxes. Third estate says no. And the first two go, yes, yes. Doesn't matter what you think. Sorry, you lose. Right? Um, <coughs> so the third estate decides, hey, we should do voting in a different way. Let's do voting by headcount, where each individual delegate gets a vote. And this is going to make things more equal, because there's about 300 delegates from the first estate. There's 300 delegates from the second estate, but there's 600 delegates from the third estate. So if they do voting this way, at least you, have a, you can end up with a tie. And possibly, if just a couple people swap votes from the first and second, they can convince them and get some more power. And, but this is going to become a problem to vote by delegate because the king decides, uh, I don't like this either. This doesn't seem to be going well for me. And so once they decide, oh, we're going to vote this way, he says, OK, uh, time out. Uh, third estate, uh, you can leave. We, just kidding, no estate general, just first two estates, because he sees what the writing on the wall is, which is that the commoners are going to end up taking some power. He shuts down the third estate. And the commoners and the delegates from the third estate decide they're actually going to, to not go home. They're going to go to a, to a tennis court, literally. Uh, and they're going to have a meeting of just them. And they are going to meet at the king's palace at the unused tennis courts. And, um, it, and so they are going to basically have a sit-in. They're going to stay there until they get what they want. And they're not going to leave, and they're not going to go anywhere until they create a new constitution that gives them a little bit more say. Um, and so it's a radical thing to do. They could argue that this kind of starts the French Revolution because they are calling for a revolutionary change in the way things are done. The next month, after taking the tennis court oath, members of the Third Estate, they're all living in Paris. Remember, they're not going to go home until they get a new constitution but we start to see a political crisis escalating. And at the same time that they're in Paris demanding that the king meet with them and that they're allowed to write a new constitution for France, economics continue. The price of bread skyrockets, and riots start to break out all over Paris over the price of bread. The urban workers are very upset. They can't afford to feed their families. The king decides he's going to send troops in to quell the riots. And these tensions are going to get really, really high. Uh, the king is trying to attack the members of the Third Estate. He wants to suppress them. In all of this chaos, you have this crazy stuff. Rumors start going. No one knows who starts it. But a rumor starts that the king has started to stockpile weapons at the Bastille prison, which is where they took all the political prisoners. He, they're saying, hey, the king is building up weapons, and he's going to come in and just slaughter us all so that we, can, so that we shut up. Now, there aren't any weapons there, but they end up marching on the Bastille prison. And when they get there, they break into the prison. They kill the, the governor of the prison and many of his lieutenants. They cut their heads off. They stick them on pikes and parade through the streets with heads on pikes. Okay? Um, Bastille prison was a place, like you said, kept a lot of political prisoners. Um, they break into the prison. They... Uh, they free prisoners, and um, <clears throat> on July 14th of 1789, um, this is basically the symbolic start of the French Revolution. Re Revolution. The commoners are rising up. Uh, they take the tennis court oath. They uh, storm the Bastille prison. They actually tear the whole thing down. 
Yeah. Not playing any games. And the date July 14th is celebrated every year as their equivalent of our July 4th. It's a significant holiday. It's called Bastille Day. Um, and uh, people rise up to demand their rights and liberties for themselves. And you can see how, you know, this is going to be incredibly violent. I mean, they took these dudes' heads and went through the streets with them on poles. When we look at the origins, we can see how they're interconnected from the ideas of the Enlightenment, though, particularly when it comes to the Third Estate's demand for political rights. Think back to how people like uh, Montesquieu talked about, you know, a separation and balance of power. John Locke calls for everyone to have life, liberty, and property. And these calls are really calling for the removal of absolutism and, in, and putting in place a constitutional mon monarchy. At the very heart of the Third Estate, what they demand uh, is, is, you know, to have more say, to have representation. And the fall of the Bastille really represents the potential for a full-on revolution that's going to be incredibly violent. And many people don't know how much this is going to, how much of a toll this is going to take. Um, but, you know, the French Revolution sees the rise in the invention of the guillotine, uh, some of these things. And, of course, you know, people like Marie Antoinette are going to, uh, you know, <clears throat> not be so well at the end of this. Uh, she's going to lose her head. So is the king. So are thousands of others um, during this revolution. And it's going to be a major turning point in the history of Europe and really of the world. Um, and it's going to be really, really deadly and violent. And that's going to bring us an end to this first section. <laughs>